Okay, great. Um, thank you, Alvaro. So today we're going to talk about um, something quite different from what we did before. Um, so we're going to talk about P torsion and characteristic P. So remember that so far we've been talking about the L adictate module and Frobenius on the L adictate module, where L was the prime that was co-prime to P, right? So not equal to P. Uh, today we're going to um, uh, remove that assumption, right? And we're going to examine the P torsion of the Jacobian of a curve in characteristic P. Okay. This is what happens. So, from Galois theory, so um, or field theory, um, F, which is a polynomial over some field, right, is called separable. It has distinct roots over the algebraic closure. Um, so, as an example, if you look at the polynomial x to the p minus 1, right, in characteristic p, and this is not separable. Uh, separable. And the reason for that is that x to the p minus 1 is x minus 1 to the p. Right? So, um, so this, is a, this is a purely inseparable polynomial. Purely separable. Okay. And uh, an extension of fields, right? So if you have k, k prime over k, right? So an extension is called separable if for any alpha, right? So if you take some element in k prime, right? And you looked at the minimal polynomial, m alpha of x, Right, this is separable. Um, so that's the definition of a separable field extension. And so, how do you extend this definition to curve or maps? Right. So you look at um, if you have an, any map between two varieties. Right. So um, this applies to any varieties, but we will be interested in curves. Right, so for us, um, maybe I will just state this for curves. So let's say C to C prime is a um, dominant map of curves. Okay, so it's surjective on um, a Q bar point. Um, and so this is called separable. Um, or inseparable, whatever, whichever property you're looking for, right? If the corresponding um, map of function fields, right? So you look at Kc prime, and then you look at the induced uh, map of function fields, which gives you a field extension. If this extension, if um, is separable, respectively, inseparable, right? So the property of the curve is determined by the property of the function fields. Awesome. So that's the definition that we'll be working with. So notice that we've already seen an example of a separable of, of an inseparable map, right? So um, example, right? So we've seen the Frobenius map, right? Frob P extends x y to x to the p y to the p. Um, so throughout this section, what I'm going to do is, this is for convenience of notation because I'm going to use this over and over again, I'm going to let f denote frob p, right? So whatever curve I'm working with or whatever Jacobian I'm working with, um, f is going to denote the p for p, right? Um, and so here e is some elliptic curve defined over fq, q a power of p, right? So this, um, this extension, right, is a degree p extension. So this is a degree P extension, and um, what you can show, so this is part of the exercises from lecture one, this is a purely inseparable extension, right? So because this is all the Pth powers. And so it's the, the polynomial generating this extension is like X to the P minus one. So 
um, purely inseparable expansion. Creepy. Um, and so notice what happens with purely ex inseparable extensions, right? So what happens is if you try to compute three images of a point, right? So three images um, of a purely inseparable uh, map, Um, well, okay, maybe I won't say it purely, I'll just say inseparable map, right? So they seem to collapse. Um, what I mean by that is that because it's a degree P map, right? X goes to X to the P, normally you would expect this, any point inside, um, any point of the form X to the P, Y to the P, to have P pre-images, right? So, if you were in characteristic zero, you would expect this to have P pre-images. But because you're in characteristic P, somehow all of those, your expectation is violated completely, right? So you're, um, you, physically speaking, there is just one pre-image, right? So, so physically there's one pre-image, but somehow it's like, it's like a repeated root, right? So it's repeated P times. So um, here is an exercise. So one way of detecting um, inseparability is so detecting inseparability. In gen, this works in general as well. Um, right. So one way of doing this is computing the map on differentials. So you can compute. Map on differentials. What I mean by this is that if I have any map between two, um, let's say, varieties, right, and I take some um, dg, a differential on y, right, so differential on y, right, so what that means is that g is some function on y, and then I'm taking dg, right, so. Um, subject to the usual relations. So there's, so let's call this map F. F induces a map on the differentials, right? So you could, you know, generally we call this F star. So F star of DG, you can define this as E of F composed with G, right? Um, oh, sorry, uh, this is the wrong order. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? So you, G is a function on Y, right? So you need G composed with F. My bad. Um, sorry. So what, right? So for instance, for the Frobenius map, right? So the Frobenius map is, is an X to the, um, is a map that sends X to X to the P, right? So um, for example, if you take um, the Frobenius map, Then what does it do to something like dx, right? So let's try to try to see that. So maybe you're on P1 or on an elliptic curve or whatever you want, right? What does f star dx do, right? So this is just d of x to the p. It's p times, well, um, x to the p minus one dx, right? By the power rule, Leibniz rule, whatever you want to call it, this is just zero. Right, so in general, uh, in, inseparable maps induce, so you can show this in general, um, for curves, inseparable, for varieties if you want to be ambitious, um, inseparable maps induce zero maps on differentials. So, that's like one key way in which we can detect inseparability of maps. Okay. Um, and so, okay, so before I go on, are there any questions? Any questions? I don't see any in the chat boxes. Um, I'll let you know if something comes up. Okay, great. Um, 
So here is a fact. So re recall that if you have the Jacobian, right, because it has a group structure, you can talk about the isogeny, which is multiplication by P, right? So multiplication by P. And it turns out that P, multiplication by P in characteristic P has this inseparable component, right? So, so, um, so P always, so the fact is that P always um, factors the Frobenius. Right? So what that means is that in general, there is a map, so write this down first, da -da. So you can look at this. So this is F, right? Um, so F is just the induced action on the Jacobian, right? So um, I wrote it down for a curve, but you can, it induces an action on, a, well, not action, but like it induces a map on the corresponding Jacobians. Um, and uh, right. so this is the multiplication that we have. So what this says is that there exists a V such that this, this diagram commutes, right? So P you can write as V composed with F, right? So multiplication by P always has this inseparable component. So for elliptic curves, this just turns out, so V is called the Verschiebung. In general, its construction is hard. So for elliptic curves, you can construct it quite, uh, so you can construct it in terms of what is called a dual isogeny, right? So um, for elliptic curves, not too bad. Oops. The construction is not too bad. Right, but in general, it takes a little more work to show what the construction actually is. Okay. Um, and so sometimes I'm gonna call Verschiebung the dual to the Frobenius um, because in the elliptic curve case, it actually is the dual isogeny. Um, but- So Min? Yeah. Um, th there's a question. Is there a geometric way to interpret the fact that inseparable maps induce a zero map on differentials? Um, geometric way. Uh, that's a good question. I think the way I would. Mm, I, I don't know about a geometric way, right? So somehow. Inseparable maps are things that sort of like locally, right? They look like x to the p minus a, where a is some a belongs to your ground field. So it's an aside. So what I would say is that x to the p minus a. So if you're in a one-dimensional thing, this is what it looks like. If you're in a multiple-dimensional thing, it's just a bunch of these kinds of maps. Um, but locally, what what this does is it's like it's taking p roots. Um, and then taking differentials of things that are P as powers just vanishes in characteristic. I don't know if there's a better way to, I don't know if this is satisfactory, geometrically speaking. I would just say that D of X to the P is, is zero in characteristic P. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if a satisfactory way to answer it, but this is, an answer. Yeah, maybe I'll think. I'll, I'll think about that, and maybe I'll post something on this with us. Right, so, yeah. Um. Well. Yeah. So I mean, differentials somehow measure like ramification and how much roots collapse. I, I think every the, the the root of everything is this is this fact. Um, yeah, but but maybe maybe I'll just I'll, I'll think of a better way to answer that and then get back to you. Okay. So, okay, 
great. So as a corollary to what we have from before, so for, um, okay, so um, recall, so from above, right? So we have V composed with F equals P. This is a degree P to the G map, um, sorry, to G map. And F, right? So he, this is on the Jacobian and the Jacobian, so Jacobian of C is G dimensional, where G is the genus of the group. Right? And so F has degree P to the G, and V also has degree P to the G. Right? So the degree P to the 2G map breaks up into these two degree P to the G maps. Right? Um, and so this is degree P to the G on the Jacobian. Right? Because I'm thinking of a G dimensional variety. Awesome. Um, so as a corollary for elliptic curves, we have the following. So let's say E over FQ is an elliptic curve. Um, then if you look at the FQ bar points at the P torsion of E, then there's two options. This, that is a Z mod P, in which case the elliptic curve is called ordinary. And that this is zero, in which case the elliptic curve is called super singular. Right? Um, so these are so ordinary and super singular. These are the definitions, right? So this is how you define these. Um, and so the idea of the proof is the, is just what, what we said before. Idea of proof right, is that because V composed with F is multiplication by P, the kernel of F is contained in the kernel of multiplication by P. Right? So, and this, because F is an inseparable map, just collapses to a point, right? So it's inseparable, so F inseparable. So this doesn't contribute anything. Never contributes more than one point. One, right, which is zero. So physically speaking, it doesn't contribute more than one point. Um, and so, um, right. And and so whether or not P is, so so this is a P to the G, I'm oh, sorry, um, you're in a genus one, so this is a P squared, um, th this isogeny has degree P squared, right? And then you're killing off a bunch of possibilities coming from this degree P component. So the only thing that determines what the size of, so therefore, EP, so the size of this is determined Q bar completely by V. Determined by V. And now, um, or the size, basically the size of the um, kernel of V. Right. And so V can be either separable or inseparable. And if V turns out to be inseparable, then you're in the super singular case, right? Because that also doesn't contribute any points. And if you're in the separable case, then you get Z mod P, you get the ordinary case, right? So this is ordinary, and this is super singular. In general, so you might ask what happens in general for a general curve, right? So curve C over FQ, a curve of genus G. Now the Jacobian, right? If you look at the P torsion of the Jacobian, this is always isomorphic to Z mod PZ to the sum power S. And now S is allowed to be between zero and G, right? So remember that Frobenius was a P to the G map. And now because Frobenius is, is purely inseparable, you're killing off all of the P to the G possibilities that could have come from that, for, that could have come from Frobenius, right? And so the only thing that you're left with is Vershebang, 
And depending on how how inseparable Vershebang is, you could have um, either zero Z mod P to the, to the either zero Z mod P's or G Z mod P's, right? So um, definition for C or it's Jacobian, definitely it's Jacobian is called ordinary. So, Mia? Yeah. Uh, somebody is asking, uh, why does inseparability imply that the kernel is trivial? Separability? Inseparability? Yeah. Why does inseparability, inseparability imply that the kernel is trivial? Right. Um, so, in general, what inseparability does is that it, it collapses the three images, right? So, for instance, um, so uh, maybe I'll here in a small box, right? So if you if you look at x y maps to x to the p y to the p, right? The kernel, um, well, the, so uh, the, so the kernel turns out to be the same as like the number of three images um, in this map, right? So um, so um, well, the number of three images happens to be equal to the size of the kernel, right? So you can basically calculate the number of pre-images at any point instead of calculating it at zero. Um, oops, size of kernel, um, typically. And so if you look at any point of this form, x to the p, y to the p, in characteristic p, um, you're looking at the number of pre-images of this point, right? So um, so what is a good way of saying this? Uh, hold on. Um, yeah, just know what I want to. What is it that I want to say? So, right. So what you want to do is you want to look at. Um, So maybe a better way of saying this is the following. Sorry. So a better way of saying this is that if you have a map of two, um, let's say elliptic curves, right? And you look at what it does to the local rings, right? So the degree is determined in the following way. So you write this, E, and then you look at some point, right? Um, okay, I need more space for this. Uh, I'm just going to start a new page. Great. This is going to be better. So E to E prime, right? And now you look at K E prime to K E. And so now what you do is you localize this as a, at a point, which means um, you just pick whatever whatever your favorite point is. And then um, you, you sort of write everything in one variable, right? So you look at the local ring. So P inside here and look at local ring. Ring at P. Right. Um, and so what this would tell you is that this map, so this, so and you do the same thing here, except with like the pre-image of P. Mm, say this is P, P inverse P. And um, what this does is that locally this map looks like K adjoint T um, inside. So, um, oops. so here, so K, oops, my bad. K adjoint, um, well, let's call this U. So this looks like T maps to um, U, where U is like P to the one over P. So locally, this map looks like extracting P as powers. Um, I don't know if that's um, right. I hope this answers your question. Is it somewhat satisfactory? Okay. So. Okay, so what that means, okay, so if it, if it locally looks like extracting P's powers, 
um, what does that mean, right? So it means that, um, okay, so, right, so, um, yikes, sorry, it's a good way to explain this. So, ah, an absolute e to the one over p. I think that for now you can maybe move on and then uh, we can talk to the student later. Okay. It's up to you. Right. Okay, great. That, so, I mean, what this means is that like, okay, oops, no, that's not what I wanted. Great. Um, yeah, so, what you can show is that the minimal polynomial of anything that's here, right? So if you if you take u, um, the minimal polynomial of u is um, it satisfies t to the p minus um, t. Right, that's right, equals zero. And this is an inseparable map in characteristic p. This is t minus t to the one over p to the p. So it's an inseparable element. Okay, hopefully that's helpful. If not, I'm happy to like write it down better, right? So what happens is locally, basically your map looks like extracting p's roots. And so your minimal polynomial is t to the p minus t equals zero, which is a purely inseparable polynomial. Okay, that's better, I think. The student, the student says thank you. Okay, so, great. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So a curve is called ordinary if um, this S equals G, right? So it has the largest possible uh, P torsion. And so um, if you look at, so generally what this is called, so this is called the P rank. Uh, um, so it's called the P rank of C or the P rank of the Jacobian of C. So there is a notion of super singular in, um, for higher genus curves as well, right? Um, and there's like other finer notions, um, but I'll define that later once we have a little more machinery. Okay, so now let's go back to the elliptic curve case. So elliptic curves. And we wanna find a way, right? So we want, we want to find a way to test whether something is um, super singular or ordinary, right? I've built up all of this theory and then if I give you an elliptic curve, how do you know if it's super singular or ordinary, right? So um, what we're gonna, so notice that, um, so now I'm gonna think of F and V as endomorphisms of the curve, as endomorphisms. Um, okay, so I'm going, for now, I'm going to work over a prime field. So E is over FP. Um, a lot of these definitions and things make sense over FQ as well. And the notes sort of like write down what, which part like generalizes in what way, but just for uh, notational convenience, I'm just gonna take FP right now, right? Um, so I'm gonna think of these as endomorphisms of, of E, right? And so now remember that F satisfies a pol um, on, on the Tate module, F satisfies a characteristic polynomial, right? So of E and therefore, PLE for any L not equal to P as well. So characteristic polynomial of F right, is given by um, P squared minus APT plus P. Right? And because P multiplication by P is, is just V composed with F, he's using this equation and this Right? Um, you can see that F and V sort of determine each other over, um, over because you're in dimension two, right? So you're, you're on a two dimensional ZL module. Oops. So what this says is that AP is F plus B, right? Because it's the trace of this. This, of these endomorphisms, right? So as an endomorphism, this is what V is. Okay, so, so what we're gonna do is we wanna determine whether V is um, 
inseparable or separable. And so we want to look at its action on differentials, right? So let's, let's say omega is some differential. And so I'm going to write it as AP minus F star V, um, sorry, star omega, which is AP sub omega minus F star omega, right? This just means the induced map maps on the differentials. But this is zero because we're in characteristic P and F is always inseparable. This, well, this is just, AP is an integer, remember? So whenever you take, um, take an integer and you try to see what happens when you act on it because differentials are linear, this is just AP times omega. Right? So this follows from linearity of differentials. And so V is inseparable inseparable if and only if AP is zero mod P. Right? AP a priori is an in, is an integer, right? So but AP, so all of this 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 action on differentials is happening mod P, right? So um V is inseparable if and only if AP is zero mod P, which means this Checking whether E is super singular or ordinary. So E is super singular if and only if AP is congruent to zero mod P. And so, um, and so similarly, it, it turns out that even over FQ, you can just test AQ and see if it's zero mod P, right? Um, and the argument is very similar. So um, that gives us a nice way of testing it. And so now I'm going to come to something called the Hasse invariant, right? which is a way to calculate these APs or well, to check whether these APs are zero mod P without actually calculating them. Right. So in general, the way you would calculate these APs is find the Frobenius polynomial acting on the elliptic curve, right? If you didn't have a computer and you didn't know how to count points on this elliptic curve or didn't want to do that, right? Then how could you do it directly from the equations for the elliptic curve, right? So again, I'm gonna do this in over FP, but a generalization exists even for FQ. So if you write Y um, elliptic curve as Y squared equals FX, right? What I can do I can take fx. Um, okay, so maybe I should justify that a little bit. Oops. So notice that if I take recall that the number of points over um, um, of, uh, of of e over fp is p plus one um, minus ap. Further, if you have some element A inside FP, right? So we're in the odd prime case, right? So then A to the P minus one over two is the Legendre symbol A over P. Legendre symbol. This is P not equal to two. Awesome. So what do we do with this? Well, so remember that when we had to write the, um, um, the number of points of EP, we wrote it in this form. Right? So we said this was the sum over X inside FP of these um, the Legendre symbols of FX, right? Because that's going to determine whether or not Y is a square, uh, um, FX is a square, right? Um, and so what you want to do is you want to replace this by FX to the P minus one over two, right? So mod P, what we know is that the size of EFP is just one plus the sum over these X inside FP of FX to the P minus one over two. Okay. Great. So how do you expand this? So you expand this somehow. Just like write this out. Um, with the notation. 
3 times p minus 1 over 2, right? Because this is a cubic polynomial. Uh, ci, x to the i. Where ci is just some coefficient, right? And I'm going to reverse the order of summation, right? So this is now going to be sum over the i's. And this is going to be a sum over the x and p's. So this becomes ci, x to the i. Okay. So now you can show that um, in this sum, right? So uh, x, fp, x to the i, so exercise, it's not too bad. It's, um, you just use the fact that x satisfies a particular polynomial. Um, so this is zero unless p minus one divides i. And so these things up here, most of them vanish. The only one that doesn't vanish in this range is the one corresponding to p minus one. Oh my God, what the hell? Ah, did everything just go back? No, sorry. Yikes. Why would you do this to me? Sorry. Technology sometimes is just not your friends. <laughs> okay, great. It looks good. <laughs> now it's good, not a thousand percent. Great. Um, so great. So this is um zero on this p minus one divided i, right? So what it turns out is that the size of EFP, right, mod p is just one minus c p minus one. In particular, this says that CP minus 1 is congruent to AP mod P. So in order to test whether AP is 0 mod P, all you need to do is take the polynomial that defines the elliptic curve, raise it to the P minus 1 over 2 power, and then look at the coefficient of X to the P minus 1. Right? And so this is called the Hasse invariant. And maybe you're wondering, okay, why do I need so many tests? Um, so one, so this is actually the thing that is easier to generalize to higher genus curves. So there exists, there exist multiple generalizations. Um, just a generalization to higher genus curves. Genus curves. Um, so an example is something called the Cartier-Manin matrix. Cartier-Manin matrix, and what this is is that so um, so this sort of like in, captures captures um, the effect of V for higher genus curves. So it's a G cross G matrix that actually. Um, to, uh, figures out whether or not your curve is ordinary. And um, it turns out that, so there is, so maybe I don't have time to go through a full example, but for high, so there's an example in the notes, right? So um, for hyperelliptic curves, elliptic curves, this is very computable due to work of UE, um, very computable. And it's computed in a very similar way as the Hasse, Hasse invariant, right? So you take, um, so what you do is basically you take this, y squared equals fx. Now fx is a higher degree polynomial. And then you raise fx to the p minus one over two, um, and then look at some of its coefficients and put them in a matrix, right? So specific coefficients go in a matrix. Um, create matrix of coefficients. Certain. Awesome. Right. And then it turns out that the the Cartier in, in so over FP, this Cartier Manin matrix, which I'm going to denote C, is non singular, non singular, if and only if um, the, uh, your curve C, your curve is ordinary. 
right? So it serves as a test to see whether certain um, higher genus curves are ordinary or super singular. Well, are ordinary. Okay. So next, I'm going to talk about the notion of super singularity. Um, for that, I'm going to define Newton polygons. So maybe this is a good time to pause and ask for questions. I don't see any questions. I'll let you know if something comes up. Okay, awesome. So for, for this section, C is going to be a curve over FP. Um, again, this makes sense over FQ, harder to state. Um, as in, there's just more decorations, right? So recall that the, I'm going to write the, uh, this is the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius, right? And this, I'm going to write um, like a monster. So I'm going to do A naught. Um, x to the 2g plus a1 x to the 2g minus 1 plus a2 x to the 2g minus 2 blah 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 a2g okay. and what I'm going to do so the, a Newton polygon makes sense for any polynomial but for a curve we're going to use the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the following set of I comma new P of A I, right? Such that um, right, so I is between zero and two G. And we want to throw out the ones that are zero, right? Because otherwise you'll get infinite valuation. It doesn't really affect the thing eventually, right? So what I want to do is I want to take the set and my Newton polygon of of C is defined as something called a lower convex hull. Of S. What do I mean by the lower convex hull? Well, if I have a bunch of points, right? Let's say I have a point here, and then here, here. Uh, oops. Let's say there's another point here, maybe the fourth point here, right? So instead of joining all of the points with lines, what the lower convex hull of this set is going to be basically you take the lowermost points that make the Thing on top, a, con, a convex object, right? So this is lower convex hull, <clears throat> excuse me, of this set, right? So anything above it, it forms a co convex set. Awesome. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and so now let's see what kind of information this gives us about the curve, right? So example, um, let's take an elliptic curve. So for an elliptic curve, you have um, uh, a zero, which is one, right? So maybe I'll just write, okay. Now let's write that. Um, x squared plus a one x plus a two, right? Oh no, I shouldn't have picked a's. Okay, whatever. Um, so notice that this, well, characteristic polynomial of Frobenius, blah, blah, blah. This is always, um, one. This, because we're over F, um, FP, is going to be P. And this is what we call the APEs. Okay? Well, negative of that. And so now, and so if you're an elliptic curve, right, so you have one case. So if it's because you only care about the valuations, right? So for um, so so you only care about you don't care exactly about what these coefficients are, but what, what their valuations are, right? So remember that when we said when we were looking at ordinary and super singular elliptic curves, ordinary elliptic curves satisfied that this had um, had zero valuation, right? So this was not zero mod p. So this the valuation of this mod of uh, the p adic valuation of this is zero. Similarly, for super singular curves, it's non zero, right? Um, and so, what this gives us is that for the ordinary case, um, you get uh, so this gives you the point zero, zero, 
this gives you the point one zero and this gives you the point two one so one and so your newton polygon is this okay. ah sorry for your super singular case Um, mm -mm. Right, so you you're still going to get zero zero, and you're going to get two one. But because of the Hasse weight bound, this middle coefficient is going to be zero, and so you're not going to get anything in the middle. So this this is just going to be a straight line going from here to here. So the slopes. So the one of the ways to like um, describe a Newton polygon, right? is to is to talk about its slopes so the slopes here are zero one and the slopes here are one half one half right you repeat it twice because you want to keep track of how many segments you're going through so this is two one zero zero okay so um so newton polygon sort of detect Detect the p rank of the of the elliptic curve, right? So all ordinary elliptic curves have the same looking Newton polygons, and all the super singular ones also have the same similar ones. So let's try a genus two curve. So, and because of the lack of time, I'm going to do only one of the examples. But there's today my my app really does not like me know what to do. Things work. Okay. Oops. Sorry about that. So for a genus two curve, we're gonna take a hyperelliptic curve. Well, all genus two hyperelliptic curves. Never mind. Okay. Uh so we're gonna take the following curve. I've calculated it's for Venus polynomial ahead of time so that you don't have to watch me struggle to compute the number of points on things. Um so this is the curve. It turns out that it's Frobenius polynomial um, has coefficients um, given as follows. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the numerator of the zeta function first. Um, and just, okay, so let me see if I can write this correctly. Maybe I should just write it directly. So it's going to be t to the fourth um, plus three. T uh, cubed plus five T squared plus fifteen T plus twenty five. So, um, so this is your Frobenius polynomial, and if you plot the points that this gives you, then you get the following. Okay, so you have a zero zero, right? And the next one should be a one zero. Uh, then you have a two one. Um, and then there's again a three one, right? And then there's a four two. So I should say here that Sage can compute Newton polygons for you. If you give it the point, it'll just draw the lower convex hull. Um, so this is this line, and then there's this line, and then there's this line. Right. So the slope here, this is not greatly drawn, but it's you can see what's happening, right? Because it's the lower convex hull, you get these slopes, right? And notice that here, this is not this is um, this is like not one of the shapes that you get for the ordinary and super singular case for elliptic curves, right? So as as your genus increases, the number of options for your uh, Newton polygon actually increases. Um, and so these are the slopes. And it turns out, so maybe I'll say a few things about the Newton polygon. So properties slash definitions. So the, um, the P rank of C is always equal to the number of slope zero, um, slope zero segments. 
the Newton polygon of C. Okay. Second thing is that the Newton polygon always starts at zero, zero and ends at two GG. And this is because um, you can you can sort of see this from the way conjectures, right? Your last coefficient has to be p to the g, right? Um, and it's always symmetric. And you can see this from again the way conjectures, the symmetry or the functional equation, so it's symmetric, um, right? So the number of slope lambda segments. equals the number of slope one minus lambda segments. And you can see, um, and this comes from the functional equation in the way conjectures. <laughs> Excuse me. And the last thing is the definition, which I've been promising you for a while, is that the curve, so the Jacobian of the curve, is called um, super singular if the Newton polygon only has slope one half of uh, segments. Only has slope one half segments. And so because I'm out of time, I will end there. I'm happy to answer more questions on this. And if you will let me talk about open problems in the area. I'll stop.